The U.S. Empire, which is responsible for more death and killing and murder and coups than any other country since World War II. We are divine? Are you out of your goddamn gourd? How did this not make Russell Brand just vomit all over his desk? Most of what I'm criticizing in this interview is Steve Bannon, but I will say that during almost all of it, Russell Brand's pushbacks are very light. There was no, there was no point where Steve Bannon was like, whoa, whoa. Uh, he just, he was never pressured like that. So it's like, if you're going to talk to a monster, a full on monster like Steve Bannon, then you need to be prepared to press him on things he's saying, things he said in the past. I know, I know he's made many racist comments. I know one of the ones that went viral was him saying, I'm paraphrasing, but he said, basically, you shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be ashamed of being racist. You should be proud of it. You know, most of the time he's not that clear with his with his racism and his bigotry. Most of the time it is this dodgy, you know, he knows how to use the dog whistles and the terminology so that it sounds like he's just populist. He just wants the popular thing, the thing that people like, right? And I just want to see the people rising up and taking back the country. What Russell Brand doesn't or barely calls him on is... When, when Steve Bannon says the people, he means a very specific type of people. He said, oh, he says the working man. But he doesn't actually mean that he wants to align with every different type of person who feels wrong or betrayed. He means he wants largely white people. But whether it's just white people or not, he wants these people to rise up and support this far right system that he is you know, a warrior for his own word. Here's another thing. A lot of the things he's saying are not things I'm opposed to, like increasing freedom or being opposed to feudalism, right? You're pushed down into a lower level while the overlords run everything. And and that's part of how this con man bullshit works, right? Is you say to people the things that sound good to them and they don't even realize they're following the white supremacist pie, pie Piper. And by the way, if you case you're wondering, these two look chummy as, as, as beer and pretzels, all right? These two look like they are besties. These two look like they hang out together on the weekend. I, I'm not actually opposed to having people you disagree with on your show. Like, fucking have them on. But then you better be ready to debate them. You better be ready to call them out. You better be ready to destroy them. If you go back and look at the Oxford uh, Union speech, that was a pretty good call. That pop because the day it was several years later and it's right wing populism and left wing populism. I think the reason is, is that the oligarchs that particularly control the West uh, have been so over the top in their greed, uh, in their incompetence, their greed and their incompetence that people are rising up all over. And you see that whether it's the collapse of the Tory party in England the rise of uh, alternatives for Deutschland and Germany, the rise of the right in Latin America, Central America, and obviously the Trump movement in the United States. So I think it's a combination of their greed and their incompetence. The elites have uh, have failed us and they failed themselves. Okay. Okay. So he talks about how the elites, are you not one of the elites? You are a multi, 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 multi millionaire who came from Goldman Sachs. That's where he's from. Goldman Sachs, okay? You were the top advisor of the president. How are you not one of the elites? How are you like, these elites, oh, they're, they're causing trouble. And he also, throughout the interview, talks about Donald Trump as if Donald Trump is some surly Robin Hood and living in the woods and he's going to take on the elites and take on the power. He was president. He was president. For four years, he is, you cannot name someone more elite than Donald Trump. He's a billionaire, uh, whether whether he exaggerates it or not, he's still a billionaire. He came from an elite rich family. He's been elite rich his whole life. He's owned, he is Mr. Corporate America. You couldn't get more corporate than Donald Trump. And he's been president of the United States. There is no more elite person in the world than Donald Trump. And yet here you have this goon who looks like Edgar from Men in Black. Remember when the cockroach takes the skin suit and puts it on? And like, he looks like that. This guy it, it acts like he and Donald Trump are not the elites. Uh, what? 
What? I mean, why is Russell Brand not laughing through all of this? Why is he not just doubled over? Like, you should either be vomiting or laughing. There's no reason to sit there and go, oh, that's, that's interesting. That's fascinating. I never thought of that. Okay, so he talks a lot about the greed and incompetence of the elites, which he's separating himself from for some reason. So greed and incompetence. Well, people are rising up because of greed, but guess what? The system that Steve Bannon promotes is the same greed. It is capitalism. It's just capitalism with some little more libertarian take off the, the regulations kind of capitalism. He's promoting, if you actually uh, you know, reduce it down, if you turn it into a reduction, you, you find out he's promoting basically isolationist capitalism with uh, with uh, uh, a, a white supremacy glaze. He doesn't, he never uses those terms, but he's not saying to change the economic system. No, no, no. He's saying, oh, the, the, the problem is the greed. The problem is these leaders we have here. The problem is the neoliberal worldview. But in fact, the neoliberal worldview and the Trump worldview are secret here 90% the same. They're almost identical. The only difference is like abortion rights and gay marriage. Okay, you see? So he keeps blaming it on greed. Well, you'd have the same greed with whatever elites he wants to put into power, which seems to be Trump and his goons putting them back into power is going to fix this system. Even though, interestingly, it did nothing to change the system when he was in power for four years. Isn't that fascinating? You think, if what you're promoting is so different and so revolutionary that when Trump was in power for four years, something would have changed at the structural level. But nope, all the same shit. Only difference is he built the wall. Only difference is a wall on part of the border. That's the difference. It's like everything he's saying is just laughable and Russell Brand's just, mm, you yeah. Good, good, good one there. So then one of the most horrifying things is he's promoting, he's saying this is why you see right-wing populism uh, making such gains around the world is because of uh, the, the greed and incompetence of these neoliberal leaders. Well, that doesn't really hold up at all if you look at the fact that many of these right-wing leaders that have gotten into power, how did they get into power? Oh, U.S.-backed coups. Oh, U.S.-backed soft coups. U.S.-backed color revolutions. U.S.-backed proxy wars. U.S. economic wars. So all the successful right-wing populism that's gotten into power, almost all of it, a great deal of it, comes down to U.S. influence, heavy influence, on these countries. One of the best examples would be Argentina right now, okay? Argentina had a left-wing government. The U.S. helped make sure that a far-right winger got into office. One of the ways they did this was by advising Argentina on a lawfare coup, which seems to be their preferred form of coup format these days. They used it against Imran Khan and others. But the lawfare coup in Argentina, what was it, like a year or two years ago? They advised Argentina on bringing false charges against the vice president of Argentina. She was a left winger and was almost definitely going to win uh, when she ran for president. She was very popular. So they bring these false corruption charges against her It and they, and they succeed. It doesn't actually get her put in prison because she was over 60 and over 60 year olds in Argentina don't go to prison for those type of charges. But what it does do is make sure she's not allowed to run for president. So using lawfare, they stopped the popular leftist candidate from becoming president of Argentina. They did, I'm sure, many other things to help facilitate President uh, Millet from, uh, to facilitate his run. So now you have President Javier Millet, who is a horror show. OK, and this is what Steve Bannon wants to be happening in various countries is people like Javier Millet. Javier Millet, I mean, it's tough to even begin to list all the horror, the horrible things he's done. He said Israel's doing exactly right and he signs off on all of it and he says they've done nothing wrong. He has asked the CIA 
and the U.S. government to come into his country and basically take over security. He's asked Israel's Mossad to take over a lot of the security in Argentina. He is using the apparatus of the state to suppress and attack and censor and imprison and murder uh, those who protest against him. The fascist apparatus of the state has said things, I don't know whether he has probably, but has said things like, it's uh, for for anyone protesting against him. It's prison or the bullet. And this is what Steve Bannon wants. And he calls this, you know, populism and standing with the work. That's what this is. Also, President Millet has, uh, of course, the Nash, uh, sorry, privatized everything. So he's selling off Argentina to large corporations. The people in Argentina are suffering. You now have 57 percent, which it wasn't near that back when the with under the last president 57% of argentinians are now under the poverty line are now poor because he is throwing the people to the wolves and selling off argentina to the rich and the powerful so anyway that's the type of thing steve bannon's celebrating and the type of thing he wants it's basically fascism right wing fascism but if you listen to him in this interview it's all i stand with the workers i want the workers to stand up but he doesn't actually mean that. He means I want them to stand up for the thing I'm supporting far right wing. And Russell Brand at one point lightly pushes back and says, uh, how about you? Or he says, are you, could you also see working with uh, uh, leftists to try and stop techno feudalism? And Steve Bannon just in, completely dodges the, the question. All right, let's get to another clip here. And there yet remains a further alternative. I've heard you use the phrase techno feudalism. And I think that's what many people, yeah. wherever they find themselves culturally or politically fear is that we're being guided, manipulated, maneuvered, in fact, into a new form of globalism where technological power is utilized to control consciousness, our understanding of the public sphere to manipulate Manipulate consent and communication. Guided, manipulated, pushed, forced to be uh, to be manipulated, to be uh, controlled. Huh? Does that sound like anything you've heard of before? Oh, maybe now, maybe present. So yes, this is a fear. What he's talking about using technology to further these things, but we're already in it. And the idea that, oh, well, if we just get what Donald Trump and President Millet into office, they're going to stop techno feudal feudalism. It's like, what are you talking about? They, they are the representatives of it. They usher it in. They go, hey, come on, techno feudalism. We're in feudalism, essentially. I mean, in many ways, because you have massive poverty two-thirds of americans can't afford a house or, or live, and live paycheck to paycheck uh the rich are getting exorbitantly richer if you don't think we're currently manipulated then look at the number of people that support the u.s proxy war in ukraine look at the number of americans that despite the fact that it's decreased still support Israel's genocide in Gaza. And just to get to a lighter form than that, look at the number of people that believe the difference between Biden and Trump is night and day. And we need to really like we are so heavily manipulated and coerced and controlled in every regard. And the idea that that nationalism makes any sense, which Steve Bannon loves, the idea that that capitalism makes any sense as we destroy our planet. I brought to you earlier in the show how the food chain is collapsing. The, the idea that wage slavery is the best way we could ever set up a society, that you or me or anyone working uh, most of their adult lives in jobs they hate in order to afford to live a life is the only way we could ever create a system is just so dumb. It's amazing. But how many people can see beyond that? How many people see outside of it? Not many because of the manipulation, the coercion. So yes, what they're talking about, techno-feudalism, is something to fear but we're like 90% there. These two, and I, I think I can include Brand in this, even though, again, I don't know all of Brand's politics, but because it keeps shifting. But these two seem to think that capitalism does, it doesn't already have a hold and that it's not already controlling things. And Steve Bannon thinks if you just get right-wingers, 
right wing white supremacists into office, then they're going to stop the greed of capital. They're, what? Show me, please, the right wing populist who has gotten into office and stopped greed. Hell, I'll even take a representative somewhere or a congressman or a senator. Point to me a right wing senator who has led an effort to stop greed. Steve Bannon is either just breathtakingly dumb or he knows that this is just the way to get a lot of people, millions of people who are poor, because you got to, if you wanted millions of people supporting you, then you are going to need poor people. They get millions of people to support uh, his just atrocious right wing shit show. It's tough to say which it is. Okay, I'll go a little further for a second. 30 more seconds. Um, can you tell me what you mean by techno feudalism, how it relates to glo globalism, and who sits at the top of that baronial class in this model of feudalism? Well, well, if you go back even to the Oxford speech, I, I tell I'm kind of uh, calling out younger people who have had a tendency just to vote for uh, progressive neoliberalism. Right. And, and really be led by the cultural side that you're nothing but Russian serfs. You're the equivalent of Russian serfs. You don't own anything and you're not going to own anything. He's saying that, oh, you know, everything's going to be different. You won't own anything. But in wage slavery, you don't own your life. You're responding to economic force in order to do things you don't really want to do. That if you were removed from that economic force situation, you wouldn't even have the same opinions possibly that you have. I mean, sure. So a lot of people, for example, graduate with a lot of student loan debt. They go into jobs. Sometimes they, they're jobs they think they're passionate about. Most of the time it's probably jobs they think they're not passionate about or they don't have passion for. But they go into them because they know, well, I got to make, you know, the, the, the minimum this many thousand a month in order to keep paying off the student loans. Well, that's a pressure of economic force forcing you to make a decision. But the Steve Bannons of the world and the right wingers of the world want to pretend economic force doesn't exist, right? They want to pretend that those of us who live in the United States, we have freedom right now, right? But most people are not free. Most people are responding to economic force uh, in one form or another. And then, the, you know, you're, you're going to own nothing. You know, this this depends on what you're talking about as to whether we actually own things right now. The state at any moment could come and take your house. I mean, hell, the, the state stole millions, well, banks in the state, stole millions of houses after 2008, millions of houses that people were uh, tricked into predatory loans and other forms of, of you know, obfuscation and, and corruption and trickery in order to m make it so that those houses could be stolen from them. And I always point out that when a bank steals your house, but when you were tricked into a loan that you didn't understand and a bank steals your house, how is that different from burning it down? How's that different from an arsonist? How's that different from the state or the, the bank slash state in our corporatocracy? How's it different from them just coming up with a flamethrower and burning it down? You can't use it. You're not in there anymore. Your family's life is in many ways destroyed. And, and they, they could come and take your house for other reasons. They could take it because they want to put a highway there. They could also, you, you look at like West Virginia, where people who had lived on land for 50 or 100 years were told, oh, you only own the surface rights. You don't own the mineral rights, the underground rights. So we can come to you know the, the plot next to you and put a fracking pipe at an angle that goes right under your house and turns your water to toxic sludge. And that's all legal, see? That's all okay under our current laws. So the idea of like, oh, you're going to own nothing. Well, what do you own right now? Most people don't own their lives. Most people work at jobs they hate. Again, he he can't or won't understand this because if you did understand it you'd be anti-cap he's got to say that oh no we're free now but any minute now they're gonna get us i do believe in a form of uh that the united states is a uh is the new jerusalem and the united states is uh, particularly endowed with uh with a relationship to divine providence the united states has divine providence we are the lord's gift to nation states like how did this not make Russell Brand just vomit all over his desk? <laughs> oh, God. The U.S. empire, which is responsible for more death and killing and murder and coups than any other country since World War II. We are divine? Are you out of your goddamn gourd? How murderous does a country have to be? before you decide they're no longer defined. It's just so breathtakingly repulsive. Imagine if you heard this and you were anybody in Africa, 
you were a Palestinian, you were anybody around the world, Latin America, you were anybody around the world who's been trampled on, abused, and subjugated by the United States for decades, would you go, oh, yeah, the U.S. is a divine, divine right to take slaves, steal our resources, abuse us, commit genocide. And here is Russell Brand, who pretends he's smart. I think he actually is smart, which begs the question, why would he sit here for this? Uh, absolutely repulsive filth. Here he is going, oh yeah, divine divine right to genocide people. That's why it was okay what we did to the Native Americans. This is divine right. We would fall into the same trap the British fell into. And I look very much to British history and the British Empire as something, I have a tremendous admiration for the British, but I don't want to make the same mistakes that the British made, right? And I see the United States, which is, remember, our revolutionary generation was an anti-imperial power. At exactly that moment that in India and in North America, because they had Canada, were about to build the greatest empire on earth, and they still did, but our revolutionary generation backed off. He has tremendous respect for the British Empire. Another white, genocidal, horrific abusive empire if you're I, I don't i'm not talking about your average brit living in uh in britain at the time i'm talking about what they did to other countries so to say you have huge respect for that and their only flaw was that they lost their empire why do they get to own all of the black people all of the caribbean people that they supposedly owned around the world why is that okay well it's okay if you're a white supremacist that's why it's okay that's the only way you can say that that's justified is if you are a white supremacist and here is russell brand having on a white supremacist and saying Oh, good, good, good points there about how Britain was the last white empire that was almost as large as ours. And they they kind of failed because they let it go. They let it go too easy. This is all so aggressively repulsive. He keeps saying that, that he's with the Russian people and the Chinese people. He just, the right-wing populism, specifically Trump, is going to get into office and help the Chinese people and the Russian people against their oligarch, against their ruling elite. So there's so many problems with this. It's tough to even break it all down. But first of all, that's presupposing that everybody in Russia does not agree with the rulers of Russia or the elected officials of Russia or whatever you want to call them. But all polls show that Putin is actually quite popular in Russia. So he didn't say, I'm, I stand with the Russians who don't like Putin. He said, I, I basically represent or stand with all the Russian people. And what he's not saying, what goes unsaid is, I want to bring down Russia, destroy their government so that we can be with the Russian workers and support them. Basically, the U.S. should uh, attack and collapse Russia. Now, I don't know that he would say we should get involved in a nuclear war, but the aim is the same. Like, all of the Russian workers should join with us for an American empire. And the same for China. If all the Chinese should join with us for an American empire. Again, this presupposes that all 1.4 billion people in China, none of them are actually fans of the Chinese government. Uh, they, sure, there are plenty of dissidents uh, in China, uh, as there probably are in every country. But there are also a lot of people who support the Chinese government and actually like the way it works. So to assume that you get to speak for all Chinese people, except for the ruling elite, and you're going to come and save them from their ruling elite is so disgusting and white supremacists and all of those things. But, but all of this is said in a, like, I'm for populism. I'm for the people standing up. Like Donald Trump is the people. And, you know, well, last time he was in office, God, he just helped all the people. He just did such a good job of helping all the people. By the way, no one put forward a bigger tax cut for billionaires than Trump did. And of course, he did it with the, the help of most of Congress. And, and the lesson for the world is that we had we had very little to start with. We only had a handful of people, but we were relentless in using every piece of leverage. Sorry, right now he's talking about uh, the fact that he and his right-wing cohort 
uh, brought down the Speaker of the House, et cetera. Which we could to throw him out. The same with Ron McGann with RNC and Mitch McConnell. This is now a populist movement that every day gets bigger. And President Trump realizes this, this will be his legacy. It's not his simply his presidency, but the movement he's built around, that will be greater than Trump and will be bigger and more powerful even after Trump finishes his second term in the White House. So yet again, act, for, first of all, even if you supported everything that Steve Bannon stands for, meaning you're a white supremacist and you have the idea of the U.S. ruling the world, he's acting like Trump's going to be any different <laughs> this time, this time around than last time, he's going to be a changed man. He's going to stand for the people when he gets into office. That's one. Two is he talks about how they're winning because they got uh, what's his name Johnson or whoever it is and Speaker of the House, and they uh, basically forced out Mitch McConnell, even though he's still there. He has far less power, and uh, he keeps saying these things as if the right wingers they put into place. Oh, are they standing up for the people? Or are they what? What are they doing that's so anti greed? That's one of his big things, right? Stopping greed, stopping incompetence. What is it? These new people that he says he that he claims he takes credit for putting into power. Uh, also, he said the leader of the RNC is now a Trumpite, and he said we did that. Uh, what is it they've done that's so so great for the people, so wonderful? What are the bills they're putting forward that have just really helped your average American? It's all bullshit. It's all garbage. He just wants a right-wing fascist state as opposed to a inverted totalitarian corporate America uh, fascist state and, you know, maybe more full frontal fascism as opposed to the kind of uh, quiet and vague fascism that we have nowadays. And that's what he stands for. Russell Brand sits there, and although he doesn't sign off on all of it, he certainly acts like it's not a problem. Russell Brand mentions Gaza for a millisecond. He says, uh, opposed to wars such as in Gaza, et cetera, et cetera. And Bannon, of course, avoids that. He says he's opposed to the proxy war in Ukraine, but he avoids the Gaza war because that's white people. That's a U.S. tentacle uh, ki killing non-white people. So for Steve Bannon, I assume that's fine. You got a U.S.-backed genocide, but largely against less than white people. So I don't know that he cares much about Israel. And if you look at Tucker Carlson, who I think agrees with a lot of what Steve Bannon says, Tucker Carlson's, I think, maybe only take on Israel that I've seen, maybe one of the only ones, was saying that it's a bad PR move, that Israel is not doing good PR. He's not upset about the genocide, not upset about the targeting of 100-some journalists and doctors and medics and, uh, and, and destroying an entire culture and bulldozing graveyards and schools and killing children. None of that's a problem, but it's not a great PR move. It's a rough PR move. Okay, I'm going to stop there because I'm too sick of... Uh... <laughs> watching this absolute garbage.